the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. different type room and uh, Mr. Wiegand will uh, give us an intro and indicate some rules and regulations that we have worked uh, other meetings with and has worked out very well. Go right ahead, sir. Okay, my name is uh, Richard Wiegand. This is um, the uh, meeting of the Greater Centerville Historians or Greater Centerville Historical Group, whatever you want to call it, and it's the 9th of June, 2003. and. Um, I can't remember all the rules, but we raise our hand and we're quiet uh, while other people speak. We raise our hand, give our names, and then we say what we're going to say. Um, I'm asked tonight to, uh, everybody in the room is going to uh, introduce themselves, give their name, and then say something about the first job they ever had they can remember either on the farm or off the farm or whatever but it's the first job that you ever had when you were very young growing up uh, we'll, we'll start with that and then we'll get into um, Wimler's Tavern we have a very special show tonight okay so. very good and Richard I'll start out with you <laughs> as long as you're in the speaking mode would you like to again give your name and your very first job um, my name is Richard Wiegand. I grew up on a farm on, in Town Centerville on Union Road. And uh, my first on-farm job, I really don't remember, but I remember the first time I ever drove a tractor, and I think I was either four or five, and I raked hay. Okay, very good. And who do you have here, please? Mary Miller. My first paying job would have been babysitting. Babysitting, very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Uh, I'm Vernon Chris. My job, first job, was working for my grandpa on a farm. Very good. Thank you. And you, ma'am? Dolores Chris. My, <coughs> one of my jobs was doing housework for each Carl Prangy and Sheboygan. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And you, sir? I'm Walter Chris. My first job was in Las Vegas Black the Shop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. And you, ma'am? I'm Florence Chris. Actually, my first paying job was when I worked at Kohler during the World War II. Okay, very good. Thank you. And you, ma'am? Kathy Wagner. My first paying job was after I graduated from high school. I worked at the H.C. Pranging Company in the office for several years. Very good. Okay. And go right ahead, ma'am. I need this. Let's see. And my first paying job that I can remember was I helped my cousin, his factory burnt down, and I had to help with housework and making food for all of the help. Very good. Paid for that. Two dollars a week. Two dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> and Dorothy? Dorothy Anderson. I don't remember what my first job was that I got paid for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and Marie? I'm Marie Pippert. And just now I happen to think I think my first paying job was working for Loretta Wimler. Oh, really? I must have been about 15. Okay, very good. Just a couple of years ago. A couple of years, not too long. <laughs> my name is Kathy Sixel, and my first paying job was working for an aunt and uncle when she had a child. I had to take care of the children, and I was in eighth grade. Okay. I had to go there for, away for the summer. Very good. Thank you. All right. Yes? I was a Wilmer years ago, okay. and my first paying job was Lever and Shoe Company. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, been eating, and my first paying job... I grew up on a farm, and I worked for Hoon's picking up potatoes. Okay, very good. Thank you. And you, sir? I'm Rich Hankey, and I, my first job here in Manitowoc County was teaching first grade at Adams School, and that was the last year they had kids there. Oh, okay. Yeah, back <laughs> in 72. Okay, thank 1972. you. 1972. 1972. Thank you. You, sir? I'm uh, Fred Jacoby, living in Manitowoc, and... I can't keep track of all my jobs, but <laughs> but the first one I really had some money was hauling, uh, driving a milk truck for uh, Gilbert Bussey. Ah, very good. To Lake to Lake. Very good. Thank you. And you, sir? I'm Willard Mathias. My first job was working in Mathias Dairy. 
<laughs> Very good. Inside deep. track. Inside <laughs> job. Okay, and you, ma'am? I'm Alice Mathias. My first paying job was picking beans and picking raspberries in Manitowoc. <laughs> and we always ended up with enough money to stop at the grocery store to buy a couple pennies worth of candy. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and myself, as a videographer, I, uh, my first job was uh, working at the pea canning companies and the uh, corn company for this Louis Johannes here in, for Cleveland. It's a driving tractor and so forth. My name is Kathy Sixel, and this evening, uh, Romelda Wimler Albright is going to be um, answering questions about Wimlers. And she is on the computer, and we are going to chat with her brother, Charlie. Okay, very in good. In North Carolina. In North Carolina, wonderful. So, wonderful. as soon as anybody has a question, shoot away. Okay, thank you. Okay, just one moment. This is Richard Wiegand. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, we're having a high-tech meeting tonight, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I also brought my voice recognition software, but I'm not planning to use it during the meeting. <laughs> but I have it sort of running, so Okay. I just got that last week. Okay. Would you like to tell us what your high-tech uh, computer uh, software is, please? Um, what I'm what I ordered was a, uh, a $28 software program from uh, IBM, and what it does is it takes dictation, basically, and it writes it on the screen. So I have to load the program on, and then I have to train it to listen to my voice. It gives me a number of paragraphs, about 15 minutes of talking, and I talk at the computer. I have a headset that I put on, and uh, it hears how I pronounce things, and then you know, I ask to go into a new document and I can start uh, dictating, you know, whatever I want. I, this is what I intend to use to write because I have a computer job and at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is type some more on the computer. So I'd rather talk as people know I like to talk anyway. So, so anyway, it's easier for me to talk. So if I can get it on, on the screen that way and then edit it, that's what I'm intending to do. Okay, very good. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. My name is Romelda. Yes, Romelda. I'm on a computer talking, well, actually typing with my brother in North Carolina. So when a question gets asked me, I'll try and answer it and I'll type it to him if he wants to add to it. Okay. So be it. And your brother, uh, yes. he formerly was from Wisconsin, I presume? And uh, Yeah, he, he hasn't lived in Wisconsin for many years. He's okay. been living in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Very good. We're glad to have him aboard. Thank you. Okay. This is Romelda. This is a postcard that was printed up many years ago. Okay. I have a smaller version behind the bar. Okay. And do you know what year that might have been, uh, as a guess, Boy, perhaps? Oh, I have no idea. And Charlie might have a copy of it at home. Okay. I don't know. All right. And uh, we're looking from what direction, if you would, please? Looking from the southeast. We're looking from the southeast. Okay. Yeah. And this would be on what street? Right now it's on the corner of Washington and Juniper. Okay, very good. And, uh, okay, any any further information on that building at this point? No, it was pretty much the same. Okay, and in the, front, the fire. in the front of the building, if you could describe a little bit the locations of various things. I know there was a hall, a the, tavern. Uh, the tavern is right here. In the front there? Yep, this okay. is a bar, and behind it was a dance hall. All right. This is the living quarters. Okay. And then they had, what do you call it, horse rails? Yeah. Okay. Rails where you, yeah. Where you tie the horses up? Oh, yeah. They were like about four feet in the ground. We had to dig them out years All ago. Right. Okay. And, and upstairs, was that anything? Well, it used to be a hotel, the way I understand it. But I don't know what it was. But it, we used to have a lawyer's office right there. He used to come every Friday. Okay. All right. And... I really don't know any more about it. Oh, okay. Well, the dance hall was here, and the bowling alleys ended up in a ba underneath the, well, the dance there hall. There was bowling alleys in the basement? Yeah, 1938. Below? Oh, really? Not, in, not when my grandfather started it. Okay. So. Now, okay. The, uh... Copy six, so I understand that there was a Dr. Reiner, a dentist, mm -hmm. upstairs, mm -hmm. and Marie was his receptionist or his assistant. Want to tell us about it, Marie? Oh, that could have been, I don't know, 1934, 35, something like that. Okay. I was upstairs. I worked for Dr. Reiner. 
Okay. Now I had to do everything, not the way they have now, receptionist and oh, a okay. girl that worked here and a girl <laughs> that worked there, but I had to do everything. And there was a lawyer up there, too. Okay. And another thing I remember, Loretta had a beautiful plant up there, was called the Weeping Bride. And that thing always uh, left out some, like, syrupy stuff that was just a gorgeous plant. Hmm. I remember that. Okay. So you took, you were in the dentist office mm -hmm. uh, assisting the uh -huh. dentist? Okay. And the dentist, the name was again what? Adrian Reinhardt. Okay. Thank you. He was the son of the doctor in Cleveland. Oh, okay. And, and they lived right next door to my folks. Okay. Dr. Reinhardt. All right. Thank you. Yes. The, we, the, lawyer, the lawyer that came out came out on Friday afternoons, it was Joel, J-O-E-L, Fiedelman. Fiedelman. Yes. And I don't know if it's, you want kind of current history too? If you In 1974, some. the day of our fire, he drove out and saw the fire and he went home and he sat in his chair and he died. Really? Oh. No kidding. The lawyer that died the same day as our fire. Wow. He came out to see how bad the fire was. He came home and he sat down in a chair and his wife found him. He died of heart death. March 28th, 1974. Yes, ma'am. Oh. What was his name again? Joe Fiedelman. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a picture here that's being held by uh, Kathy, and she's going to explain something. This is Grandpa, what, what's Grandpa Wimbler? Grandpa Charlie Wimbler. Uh, Charlie Wimbler, and this is, well, where is it? Yeah. And that is uh, Harold Wimbler. The little guy. The little guy. Okay, there we go. It, it shows up pretty nice on the video here. Okay. And uh, the year that, again, we don't know the exact year. It, it was um, 1909 that okay. I see on the screen before. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. I'm Frederick Jacoby, and I was going to talk about the offices above uh, the tavern and so on. Yes. Uh, we skipped uh, a little space in there uh, before the lawyer. I don't know if it's the same spot or not, but there was an Eichstead dentist in there. Oh, that's, you know, that was the house behind the firehouse. Right. Uh, no, no, that was Bremer up there. No, no, I, I was, it was above your place. And that was probably right after the war. He, he had just gotten out of the uh, service. He was uh, an officer in one of the branches, and I'm not sure which. His wife was his assistant, a very young man. And uh, that was for a couple years, I think, but I can't say how long. Okay. But long enough that I had a lot of work done there. Okay. And this was a dentist, you say? Or dentist. I said. I can't think of his first name. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Elder, I'd like you to give us a few more dates on when you guys took over, when the bowling alleys closed down, how long they were all there and stuff. Oh, Have you got any dates on that? Oh, sure. Well, we'd like to know when the bowling alleys started and were they put in right away when the building was built or how much later? Okay. Very good. Thank you. My name's Romelda. The way I understand it, in 1908, my grandfather built, he never built the tavern because it came over in pieces. Um, okay, it came over in pieces from where? One of the, I, my brother was just telling me earlier, uh, the bar part was brought over from where the old butcher shop is, next to the barber shop. Okay. And another piece was brought over from next to the railroad tracks. The location I'm not real sure on. Okay. And then my father took it over in 1938 because my grandfather had a stroke and he couldn't do the run the tavern anymore. Okay. And when my I think after my father my grandfather passed away my father hand dug the basement under the dance hall because he wanted to put in bowling alleys. I'm sending you a picture I have. Okay. okay. And. Uh, he hand dug the basement and put bowling alleys in, and I, my mom always tells a story that he went to the Cleveland State Bank to borrow money. Yeah. And I don't know who was in charge of Cleveland State Bank at that time, and the guy says, well, how much can you pay off? Well, my father said, I don't know how these bowling alleys are going to go. And at that time, it was such a big hit, they bowl like from 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock in the morning. So when he did start paying off his loan, he paid it off too fast, and the banker got upset. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he couldn't win. And my dad ran it until he died in 1961. And your dad's name again, please? My dad is Harold Wimler. 
Okay. And uh, he died in 61 in March. And my mother had bowling there one more year after that because I had to take care of it. Okay. And then we discontinued the bowling. And my brother just wrote down, it was Charlie Wimler's Hotel and Dance Hall. I can remember dances when I was a kid, okay. but just barely. I can remember basketball games there, too. We used to have CYO basketball games. And I'm sure Mary, uh, Mary Miller can remember the CYO plays they had on the stage. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and we had a lot of activities there. It used to be called Wimler's Recreation Center at one time, too. Okay. And then uh, in 74, it burned down in March. And then a year later, my husband and I built our present tavern up right where it is. Okay. I okay. hope that's... Okay, anything from your brother? Other than uh, he said he was going to send a picture, but that's the one I, I think we have here. Okay. And it says it was called Hotel and Dance Hall. But my father had called it Wilmer's Recreation Center because we used to have picnics in the in a, in the summertime. My dad used to run them, and he'd have a you know Romy guys playing or whatever. All right. And I think I don't know. That pretty well covered, Alice, for you. Okay. Okay. Was there a park in the back area someplace? Well, it was a big backyard. I was we, when we were kids, we called it the park. My dad had built a bratwurst stand. Okay. Where he fried brats and stuff. And All right. Yeah, because well, it was such a big area, they called it the park. All right. was, under the bandstand, part of the dance hall, there was like a concession stand, and I sold candy bars or whatever. I don't know. All right. I was pretty young. I'm <laughs> kind of hoping. Here we go. Interested note on Dad and Adrian Reiner, Doc Reiner's son. Dad spoke no English, and Adrian spoke no German. Over the years, they became good friends. What would you like to know? <laughs> so. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Dorothy Anderson. I remember as a kid we used to go up to uh, Wimler's Hall and have uh, school events like okay. uh, plays or uh, spelling, bees. spelling bees or uh, language and uh, arithmetic. And I was told to, as a first grader, to, I was taught by Mrs. Benji to uh, uh, say a poem. And my, I didn't know enough to tell my folks I had to be up there. The next day, oh, was she mad? <laughs> I hadn't come up to represent Red Arrow School. And oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> Never will you get one again. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so it had a multi-function. Oh thing, yes, huh? I, you've you had. You ever got a picture of that? Well, she has bigger pictures. Oh, okay, just Do one I more. Take them? Sure. I'm Mary Miller. I remember when I was a young girl that they, we would have outdoor movies in the park by Wimmer's Park. We had to pay. Okay. I don't know, five ten or whatever, and then he would get movies there. No kidding. And we'd sit on the benches and watch it. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yes, it was close to home. <laughs> yeah. You have a question, Richard? Thank uh, you, Mary. Well, I have a comment, um, Richard Wiegand. My first recollection of Wimler's was um, my dad took me to Cleveland, probably to the, I went along to the feed mill and I was about four and a half years old, and my dad's 32nd birthday was and this was in 1953. And we stopped at Wimler's and we went in and my dad had a drink. I don't know what he drank, but he went in and had a drink. Okay. And I think Arno Sixel was in there, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was one other comment. I remember uh, Harold Wimler used to walk around with a flashlight in his pocket, in his back pocket, because he was always going in that room off to the to the right, I don't know if he went in there to get beer or what, but uh, he needed a flashlight to see where he was going, so he always had this flashlight in his back pocket. Okay, very you know, good. Kathy Anderson, we have a picture here of the dance hall and a stage where we had many things going on as kids, this uh, presented up at Wimler's, and uh, that's uh, Charlie Wimler standing there. Okay. Uh, and. Um, then the tavern was attached, and here's a picture of the tavern. Okay. I, before we go to that, I got a question in regard to the location here. The stage was located on what end? East or west? North. North, north. north end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because if you see a picture of the entrance here. Oh, please. There we go. Uh, Richard Wiegand, reading from the screen from, from uh, Charlie Wimler. Um, the question is, which dentist was in the upstairs, Dr. Reinert or Dr. Eichstadt? 
and uh, Charlie said that Doc Reinert was there first. Then around 1949, Eichstead took over. He was recalled for the Korean War and left early in the 50s. Doc Reinert left in the mid 40s. 40s. Then the office upstairs was used by Joel Edelman. 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 Oh, Edelman. Okay, the lawyer. Okay. All right. Very good. I have one other yes comment uh, that I'll make in that the Wimlers also rang the uh, the noon uh, siren. You know, the 12 o'clock siren every day in, in, in uh, Cleveland. Okay. And I was in there, you know, a couple of times when somebody ran off and set the thing off. You know, they turned whatever it was. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank Jacoby, you, I was thinking of other uses of the hall. Yes, sir. Uh, I remember on many uh, Sunday afternoons, my father would stop and I'd be along with him and uh, the young guys are playing basketball. Oh, this is when I was a pretty small kid. So okay. it goes back to the 30s okay. and 40s, probably mostly. And uh, then they, those were the days before they had uh, primaries, and so they used to have the political caucuses in uh, Wilmer's Hall. Okay. And it was a, a meeting, and there you selected the candidates for the town jobs and maybe a little more. I, I can't be specific, but especially the town jobs. And the caucus was a big deal. Okay. That, that hall used to be filled. Okay. People uh, trying to get their favorite candidates for whatever sure. reason. All right. And then um, uh, farm bureau meetings were held there too, um, okay. for a stretch. Very good. Okay, thank you. The gentleman here who would like to introduce himself. Melvin Yaney. The stage is up front here, or it would be the north end. And the other stage, which was used when they had picnics, was over here. And the band sat, sat up in there above the oh. concession stand. Okay. And uh, the building was used like for John Deere shows and uh, international harbor shows. Uh, I wrote my sixth grade exam there. Okay. I don't know about the seventh. Later on, we moved to center school. Yeah. Okay, in other words, they had a special location for you to take these exams to move on to the next year, is that right? Yes, and it was most of the five schools. Five schools in town center. Oh, really? Okay, very good, thank you. This is Ramelda again. Um, I don't know what it, when this occurred, but I can remember an old picture of the tavern where the bar ran along the west wall and there was mirrors in back. And then when we had a clean out for the fire, or before that, I found little mirrors, mirrors that were about this wide, about that long, and my mom said she had them cut from the, or they were from the original mirrors in the tap, there you go, in the tavern. Okay, I'm gonna put light on this one. <laughs> I still have one of the mirrors hanging in my house, but I still got the, 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 I don't know what you call them, like board type mirrors. And she said those went around, uh, the way I understood it, they were going, they went around these things. They were okay. against the oh, wall. Okay. But I don't, re well, that was a long time ago, and I still got those mirrors. But I think it was my dad who, who changed the position of the bar from against the wall to the big horseshoe that it, that it ended up in. Okay, now this bar was the first bar? Or this the, was the one by, must have been my grandfather's bar. Charlie. Grandfather Charlie. Okay. Then they changed, my dad took this away and made it a great big horseshoe okay. bar. I don't know why. Okay. Maybe because he installed bathrooms? Okay. I don't know. Very good. Thank you. Uh, this is from memory. Okay, uh, you've got somebody coming from your brother there. Uh, would you want to read that a little bit yeah, as I, a review? I had I had not heard about oh, Romelda. Yes. I had not heard about the political caucuses that you had mentioned. So I asked my brother, and he replied, there were minstrel shows, dances, farm bureau meetings, Isaac Walton fishing game, card parties, plays, parties, and basketball games. I don't remember the caucus. He said, so there yeah, must have been a long I was time. There. Yeah, it was probably earlier. Okay, I don't know, but I can remember I a lot of things happening in the dance. Okay. In fact, the last wedding reception we had in the dance hall was my oldest brother's first wedding. Okay. And that was in 1956, right. could have been. After that, we didn't, we didn't have any more functions. That's the, that's the last one I remember. There might have been some after that, I don't know. There was a question brought up, I believe, by someone oh. in regard to the band. Yeah, that that's right. My father organized the band. It was called the Cleveland Nighthawks. Uh, I don't know who was in the original band, but I know towards when my dad had died, uh, Hank Rack was 
played the accordion, and I don't know who, who was the drummer at that time. But okay. I had found the things for the put over the, the where the notes are held. Oh yeah, the band uh, stand or band something. Band stand, yeah. And I had uh, they sur to revive the, they survived the fire, and I gave them to Hank Rarick because he played in the band for many years. And sure. He would have appreciated Wonderful. it. Good. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard Wiegand, uh, three different items. Uh, when did Wimler's start? I don't know if I missed that. 1908. 1908, okay. Uh, the second thing is, was that the last place in Cleveland that had hitching posts before it burned? Because I remember the hitching posts. And the other thing is, with, with the band, and maybe Edith is going to answer this, I remember Harold Wimler being on the stage at uh, Gretz's in between you know, when Romy was taking a break or something like that, and Harold would be playing drums, and Roland Lutzi would be playing concertina, and I think there was one other person, I don't remember who it was. There were three people playing something between sets. Okay. Uh, that I remember when, when I was young, so that's all I remember. Very good, thank you. I can remember my husband played many, many times with Harold Wimler. Your husband did? Yes, and he... He loves playing with Harold. <laughs> okay. And what? Roland Lutze, yes. Roland Lutze? Roland Lutze, yes. Okay. Yes. Did your husband play with anybody else other than... Uh, oh, yes. He had another band uh, with Charlie Ryan and uh, Mr. Pankritz. They, they played together, too. Okay. <laughs> Very good. And they played at Pigeon Lake. I have a picture of that, too. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Wagner, when we did the 1976 book, of the history of the area here, we state that the buildings pictured in the picture that you already have were moved to this site about 1880. Okay. The first owner was Charles Barr, followed by August Erdman, and then Charles Wimler. It was owned by the Wimler family since 1908. 1908. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then someone mentioned before that Harold walked around with that Flashlight. flashlight, and I just want to say, and maybe this, I don't know if this belongs here or not, but sure. Harold was in charge of the baseball teams here in the village, and my husband played on that team for a long time. Okay. And I have some real good recollections of coming back to Cleveland and replaying the games after <laughs> we were played in the, in the area behind the tavern. <laughs> and I have some pictures of that even. Okay, of very good. And the team and Yes, Whatever. we might want to look at that. Uh, just off the, for the record, what was the name of the team that, that Wimler sponsored where you, your husband played on? I don't even remember. I don't okay. know if it was called the Wild Cats like it is now or if it was something else, I don't remember. Okay. But Bob played on that team for a lot of years. And I remember them playing basketball too. All right. Very good. Thank you. Our friend Jacoby knows something about the Cleveland Nighthawks. Yes. They played for both my sister's weddings in... Uh, September and December 1951. Okay. Uh, Harold, Roley, let's see, and Walter Dippen. Walter was on horn. Okay. And uh, then uh, uh, there was a bowling team that yes. my father was on, and okay. Harold, John Kolb Sr., and I'm a little not so sure who the other ones were, but they were all big guys. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers my father was a big guy, and uh, John Cole Sr. was a big guy. And I'm wondering if Walter Dittman wasn't on it, and they called themselves the Beef Trust. The, the Beef? Those were the days of the trust busting in government, <laughs> and they called themselves the Beef Trust. The Beef Trust. <laughs> that team weighed more than any other team, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I see Charlie's got written up there. Yes. Where is it now? But an auto show, I remember that. They did cut a big hole in the side. And it was my dad, they had a, a, a show in there. All the cars were in there. It was Helmings of uh, the Chevy and Chewing and the Buick. I can't remember the name of the Buick company, but they cut a big hole in the wall. They and, cut a big hole in the wall to get yeah, the cars in on, there? On the, on the south side, and the cars all went in there. Really? Uh, of the dance hall? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Marie, and that they could have the hole after a while. Patch it up or nope. make a door? There's oh. a double what door do you think? Double I can remember that. <laughs> Indicate that one more time. We're looking at a building here with a... Or there, there was an auto show in Wimler's Hall. Yes. And uh, they cut a big hole, a great big hole in the wall so that, that the cars could go in there. Okay. 
And oh, I remember my mother had a cook for all those salesmen. I remember seeing six lemon pies standing there the next morning already when I got up. <laughs> I remember that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Romelda, and I'm going to read what my brother sent from North Carolina. It's, I'll just read what he wrote. Okay. Because I asked him a question about caucuses, and he talked about the farm equipment. And he says, I remember being, the barn being used for storage, and I remember Louis Mayer uh, riding a horse in the tavern. And then I said, we're talking about the band. I said, the Cleveland Nighthawks. And then we got on the baseball. He said, the night I was born, Dad was playing at a dance. I'm told he celebrated after we finished playing. And he says, when I was five or six, Dad would take me to practice. I learned my first swear words at the practice. I learned it from Rob Pippert. When he would, would miss a grounder, he would say, so hot, well, which I repeated it out on at Mom, and she got clobbered. <laughs> okay, very and good. And he says, during World War II, the, oh boy, disbanded. Most of the players were drafted. Oh. The team. The team. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, very he, good. He, so types, he types a lot slower than he thinks. <laughs> so the yeah. during that war time, the draft oh, was you? pretty heavy, and all the members. Oh, yeah. I think, I think, uh, I'm not, I might be wrong on this, but was Cook, was it, didn't Cook Kelp say he was the first one in Cleveland get drafted? Yeah. yeah. Man, I think Armando County. County. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. That's Harold Cope. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you. The team, I don't know the year, but the names on the back are B. Tomchek, Benny. Hmm? Benny. Benny Francis Pippert, G. Stark, Ed Yost, B. Jacoby, B. Pitchnick, no. W. Reinemann, Tomchek, again, mm -hmm. a different initial. Stark, M. Ewald, Harold Wimler, Gordon Pippert, I'm on the second, uh, Abe Oland, Cookie Culp, and Robert Pippert. Okay, very good, thank you. I don't know if it's a rotation, yeah, but it's... Yeah, that's... Here's looked at the band picture once before. I had sent it out as a postcard and nobody could identify um, any of the people on it, but today we have somebody that can. Okay, and go right ahead, please. Dorothy Anderson, it so happens on the back of this picture, it says second to the last on the right is Harold Wimler. So that would be the one with the drum. The big bass drum there? Right. Okay, very good. This is called the Fire Department Mar March Marching Band. Okay, very good. We didn't have that information before, thank you. Please. Kathy Wagner. Okay, Kathy, and uh, you had your husband played on this team? My all? husband played on that team for a lot of years. Okay, we're going to go down right at the left hand, okay. my left hand. We start off with Alden Boland. Okay. Adrian Zill. All right. Bob Wagner. All right. Kenny Henschel. Okay. And here's Harold Wimler. All right. Marvin Siegert. Okay. Carl Ivey. Yes. Milton Ewald. Okay. And I in the front row, we have Jimmy Dine. Okay. Roger Yost. Okay. Elroy Worthman. Okay. Ronnie Prowl. Great. Here's little Charlie Wimler, was a bad boy sitting in front. Yes. Hank Sam Pitcher. Okay. Um, Wilbert Casper. He oh, traveled yeah. with the team all the time. And Kenny Cress. Kenny Cress. Okay. Well, very good. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> they have place. We came back to Wimler's, and the fellows would have a beer or a soda, of course. And then they would replay the whole game. The whole game, from beginning to end. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few more pictures of guys okay. at so that time. <laughs> and, and that was in 56, these ones. So. All right. Thank you. Richard Wiegand, I have, a <clears throat> I have a question about what was served at Wimler's. What kinds of beer and what kinds of uh, hard liquor and, and soda did they have at that time, say in the 30s, 40s, 50s? Who can remember what they had? Okay. Thank you. I'm Fred Jacoby. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole list of what, what Harold served. Yes. But I remember that for many years, uh, in the late 40s and the 50s, every spring he imported Bach beer. Okay. Uh, how big these kegs were, I don't know, but it was the only place around that had it. He went to the trouble, and it was imported. Really? I don't know, Romelda might remember something, or Charlie. Okay. And it was special, you know, nobody yeah, else had that yeah, on tap. Sure. That was in the spring, you say? Yeah, sure, Easter times. Easter. Okay, Easter. Yeah, yeah, Bach beer. Bach beer, sure enough. Well, it was good. <laughs> I drank a little of it. Were <laughs> 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 you Probably not. 
Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to bring my father used to buy barrels of whiskey and he bottled it with his own label. Oh. I have a bottle at home. I was going to bring it. I completely forgot. It's got his, got a picture of the, the bill, the old place on it. It said Harold Wimler's. And my brother wrote further down the line that it came from Crandon. That's where he got the whiskey from. So Crandon, he bought Wisconsin, the whiskey in a barrel? In like a huge barrel and he put it in its own bottles. Yes. He had, my brother had a quart bottle, but through moving with the military, he lost it. Yes. But I, I still have mine. I said, you ain't getting it. <laughs> and I still got it at home yet. It's like a pint. But they, they don't have pints anymore. But anyway, yeah, and it has, I'm surprised the label stayed on because it went through the fire. And I'm oh, just, my goodness. I still got it. Yeah, great, I'm going to keep great. that a while. Very good. Any other things from Charlie? Okay, I asked them about the buck berries, and I think it was a uh, start. Boy, I got two questions going here. And how, did, how come he became king? He says, I guess I was two or three when he was I asked where the buck bear came. He says, I think I was the start of Mother being a stage mom. That's the king part. And the breweries always had buck beer at Easter time. I remember they had buck beer. That was the only time you could get it was nice. was at Easter, but I don't think they imported it. I, the years I'm thinking of, I, you, your father made a big oh, really? deal of this. This was imported beer. Good old lie. You never I, know. I mean, later on, they didn't. Okay. But for any number of years, he did. I know. Forties and fifties. Oh, maybe, th maybe then he. I don't know. Okay. One don't year, know though, Germany. he got some dark beer in a keg from Germany through a beer dealer. All right. What's uh, What's the last word there? Well, Munich, Minchin Brew. Minchin Brew. Minchin Brew. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that's what you were talking about. Okay. Good. Thank you. Everything off the board. Charlie doesn't know anything. <laughs> I, I know when he was crowned king, because I uh, was there. He was a king of tap dancing. I yes. went with Loretta to Milwaukee many a time. And I also forgot we had our wedding reception in the hall. Forgot that. <laughs> that good. was in 1941. Okay. All right. And, uh, okay, you talked about Charlie, uh, Young Charlie now? Yeah. He was king the, of something? The, the picture where he's got the crown on. the picture. Oh, I don't have that picture. Yeah, Alice has it right now. Okay, just one second. Mm -hmm. Been passing a picture around, and maybe Richard can uh, define a little bit of information for us? Yeah, this is Richard Wiegand. <coughs> uh, this is a picture of Charlie Wimler. He was actually quite young. He was king of tap dancing. What year was this? Uh, when was he born? How old is he? <laughs> he was born in 35. So this would have been... 37, maybe. My goodness. Okay. Boy, he's a handsome dude. Thank you. Yeah, Richard Wigan, I got a couple questions. Uh, how did Wimler's fare during Prohibition? And were there uh, slot machines in the tavern? Okay. Very good questions. Thank you. Sir? Melvin Yannick and we used to, there were five boys in our confirmation class, and on Saturdays we always walked down to Wimler and got herself a chocolate ice cream after we ate our lunch. Okay. And at that time, they had slot machines in the place, and I think there were three, a quarter machine, and a nickel and a dime. Okay. And did uh, you play those at that time? No, at all? We no, didn't no, play you them, didn't play them. <laughs> but we seen older people stuff a lot of money in there once in a while. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. By the way, when was this uh, time frame? Uh, 42, I guess. 1942. Very good. Thank you. I just have a little comment to make about Harold. Years back, it must have been shortly after we married in 1950, my husband wasn't Catholic and he'd always drive me to church. And we'd get to the stop sign by Westview, which is now Westview and Washington. Okay. He'd always say, this is how you do it. You stop before the stop sign and then you inch your way up to the street, and then you look, and then you make your turn. And every darn, and then we'd go to church that way. Every time for years, whenever I'd go on that corner, I'd think of Harold, because this is how you do it, you know? And that was a good thing. And I would like Romelda to give us a little more information on Charlie, and I think Romelda did a little dancing too, didn't you, or acrobats? Okay. They were such a acrobatic family, okay. and they used to, uh, perform at the Mikado, I think, in Manitowoc, right? Capital. The Capitol? Oh, not at the Mikado. Okay. 
once. Okay, if Romelda could give us a little sure. more. They were such little guys and yeah. little girls. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And then Romelda, uh, I asked my brother about Prohibition. It says, yes. During Prohibition, I believe near beer was served. We did have slot machines. I can remember my mom saying that we had a dog and we were, the slot machines were stolen and the dog sat in the bar watching them do it. <laughs> and, and then uh, they caught the guy who did it and my mom said they came in the bar and there were like four or five guys who were all dressed real scruffy and one guy was dressed in a nice suit. <laughs> the guy just dressed in a suit was the guy who took the slot machines. And we got them back at that time. But I know in the 1960s, we have a, got a letter from the state saying that if my if slot machines were found on the property, my mother would get a fine, and she got scared. So we borrowed a truck from Yost, hauled the slot machines down from the upstairs barn, put them in a truck, and ran them over by my uncles and put them in his barn. Well, my uncle Jesse Walters was a little nutty. And anybody who came, some people just came and saw them and thought, well, gee, I wouldn't mind having one of those, and he gave it to him. About 10 years later, my mom got letters that people wanted slot machines. They were, they'd be willing to repair them. They just wanted to buy them. So she went by my uncle's place, and I think we took about eight of them up there. They were all gone, and my uncle couldn't remember what happened to them. But at that time, my uncle was going mentally, was kind, kind of on the weak side. And I think he was crazy anyways, huh? Because <laughs> he, he, he would drink, and my mom says, you gotta get credit for drunk and driving. He said, I'm not drinking alcohol, I'm drinking beer. So, <laughs> whatever. Thank you. But right ahead, please. This is a picture of the road being built in front of the place. Apparently, at that Can time. You tip that picture ahead, just for on the top. That's the way. There we go. Thank Kingsbury you. sign is in front. I'm gonna come in kind of close here. Okay, that was one of the brands of beer they. That was. Sold. That had to be like in the early 19. A lot of old firehouses there. I don't know when it was. Okay. Whenever that picture was. This is 1974, one? and then Schlitz was being served. It just depends what time, you know, what what brand is the number sure. one. Okay. And I can remember soda. My dad had a, a thing that was a knob. This was seltzer, that was root beer, and this is orange. So if you go sideways, then you got root beer and seltzer, or if you go this way, you got orange and seltzer. And my dad bought a gallon of Coke syrup because we always drank too much soda. Can you imagine a little kid trying to lift a gallon of Coke, putting it in a shot glass, and dumping it in a glass and adding seltzer? That's how we were supposed to drink our soda when we were kids. <laughs> that was dad. I would now like to ask the family-wise, uh, do you remember when your parents got married and when they no, had children? No, they, uh, they got married in 1930. Okay. It was very quiet. They got married by the Justice of the Peace because okay. uh, my father's father was ill. Okay. My dad was Catholic at the time. Oh, he still was. When he, but anyways, about five years later, then my brother came along, Charlie. Okay. And Father Schaefer came down and said to my father and my mother, your, your marriage was never blessed, was it? And my mother said no, and my dad said no. We got married by the Justice of the Peace. Well, he says, you really should have it blessed by the church. And my mom goes, oh boy, what's that gonna all entail, you know? She didn't know, you know, how to go about it or what was gonna happen, you know? So they came, I forget who, who was witnesses for that, Marie, were you? For, well, some, he got a couple to be witnesses. They walked in church and walked up to Father Schaefer and Father Schaefer says, okay, I just blessed your marriage. And then he left. And they went, had a couple beers. That was it. She worried for nothing. <laughs> but when she had us kids in the hospital, my, my dad would always bring a case of beer. Because when people came to visit my mom, because my mom said that was the only vacation she had. She'd stay 10 days in the hospital. That was the only vacation she got. Otherwise, she's always working. And she always, always had the case of beer under the bed. And every time she had us kids, there was always one German nun. Oh, Mrs. Bimbler, I like beer, even if it's warm. Could I have a bottle or two? She'd leave, you know. <laughs> and she'd bring the empty and she'd take, the, take a full one, you know. But my dad, who, that was the way it was. Father Schaefer came and had to come to the hospital, baptize us kids. And when I was born, Father Schaefer didn't want to come to the hospital. 
And my mom got, got on the phone and said, Father, see if I want you to come and baptize my daughter in the hospital. Oh, couldn't you wait till you get home? My mother says, Father Schaefer, if you don't come in, I'll get Reverend Brown to do it. Father Schaefer came in and baptized me. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Please. Uh, Richard Wiegand, um, did Harold have any other uh, jobs? Did he, well, he was the fire chief, I believe, right? He was, did he drive the hearse also for Stoneberg? And the third, the third, yeah, the third thing is when he died, uh, there was something about his burial. Was it on a Sunday or a holiday or something like that? And Loretta called the diocese in Green Bay to ask if they could bury him on that day. I don't remember what the what the controversy was. But okay, very good. I think Romelda can answer that. Okay. <laughs> can I remember that? Yes. Romelda, my dad held various jobs. I know before he became, he, he also worked, sold cars, I think, for a while, many, many years before he ran the tavern. But he, he became fire chief after um, Bill Taple got too old to handle it, or he was assistant and ended up being chief for many years. And then after, then he also drove the curse for Earl Stoltenberg. And when my dad died, Earl never paid my dad for driving the hearse. I got it on the books. And when Dad died, my mom asked Earl Stoltenberg how much she owed for the funeral, and Earl said, I don't know what the amount was, but he said it was something to the extent that it's partially paid for already. See, Earl didn't like dealing with money, so he, he wrote down every time my Dad drove for a funeral and how much, and then added it up and okay. deducted from sure. when my Dad died. Um, <laughs> sounds dumb, but it worked. But anyways, uh, my dad died during Easter Holy Week, and he died on a Monday. So technically, like they do years ago, three days, he would Thursday, he would have been buried on Holy Thursday. But the priest at that time said that we couldn't bury him on Holy Thursday because it's Holy Thursday. And my mom said, okay, we'll do it on Wednesday. Well, my mom wasn't really happy when found out the priest, did he hold mass? in the middle of Lake Winnebago. His, he wanted to go fishing, so he had the funeral day early. <laughs> and Father Schaefer didn't realize my dad had passed away, and Father Schaefer called my mom and said, if you would have called me to come down to do the services on Thursday, I would have done it. A lot of people didn't know my dad had passed away because it didn't hit the paper until when, Tuesday or Wednesday, and he was already, he had the, you know, he couldn't bury him on Holy Thursday because it was a Holy Week but he could go fishing. <laughs> Didn't make my mom real happy. <laughs> and here, my brother writes, yep. during the war, beer was allotted based on your sales in the years before. So dad always had beer. We always had meat also because we had, we would barter a small keg of beer for a quarter or a half of beef with the farmers. I can remember there was a fire call in Newton at, can't remember the name, but it was, Jake Zeke's butcher shop. Okay. And they went, oh, my dad, you know, my dad out the door. My mom always stayed and took care of the tavern. Oh, we got to save Jake Zeke's butcher, butcher shop. We got to, you know, we got to get out there. So there my dad goes to the fire and my mom says, oh, it's rationing time. Maybe we'll bring a ham home or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, the, it was a long fire, she said. <laughs> when dad came home and my mom said, did you bring any meat back? Oh, no, we couldn't do that. We had to check it out to make sure it was okay. And the guy, and the guy who ran the bar next door to the butcher shop, he brought a couple cases of beer over. My mom never got the meat. <laughs> <laughs> the fireman did, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Sixel and Romel, that did the fire calls used to come in by your folks or the fire department, and you had to go over and do no. the alarm? We were, we were the only home in the village of Cleveland that didn't have a party line. The, the fire calls came directly to us. The fire, our phone number was 591 short one long. And the phone was on this wall and the siren was on that wall and my mom had a long dowel. And you could, they could always tell how bad the fire was. If it was a barn fire, you knew it because the, it was the way she blew the siren. In the 1960s when we got the dial phone, 
we moved a phone underneath the siren so we could hear where the fire was and blow the siren and somebody had to run out across the street. It wasn't until the 19, late 1960s that they came along with the pager system. Then we had the base station in the tavern because there's always somebody there. My mom answered the thing. In fact, my mom was 88 years old when I finally told her she couldn't run across the fire <laughs> street and open the fire doors anymore. She didn't like it, but I thought at 88, she's got to quit. You know, she falls and hurts herself. Yeah. But she was still willing to go at 90, yet, I'll tell you. She must have had spots under her or something. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And Maria Pippa, Richard asked about if uh, Harold had any other job. I remember he worked for my dad. Okay. He, I think he was a salesman, and he's the one that taught me to drive a car. I was 16. And he got into the car, it was a coupe, and it, I remember it had a rumble seat. And then he says, uh, oh, now go backwards, go forwards, and that was it. And he stuck his right foot out of the window, and then, now drive. <laughs> and that's how I got my license. <laughs> I was 16, and it cost a quarter oh. to send it into Madison. Okay. Quarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. But I'll never forget that. He stuck his, his leg out of the window and says, now drive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fred Jacoby. I'd like to comment on something that we lost on the screen and off, off the top now about, I think probably Charlie replied that some said that the Bach beer was from the stuff left over from the previous season. That's an old, old rumor that I think to the best of information never was true. Um, my son-in-law was in the brewery business and uh, then we talked about it, and he explained that to me. Is that it comes up just about every year. I suppose Easter time. Uh -huh. okay. And um, so they, they, I just very purpose. It's a very purposeful brewery system to do Bach beer. You don't just take That's something right. left over That's right. from old dirty cakes. Right. Thank but you. But that rumor is always there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Romelva? Yes. How many of you guys set pins for my dad? Yes, that was for bowling. That's for bowling. Okay, just one moment. By yourself? I'm Vernon Chris. Uh, I helped dig the basement there okay. many years ago. And later on, uh, when the bowling alleys were installed, yes. there were some evenings I got called to set pins over there. Okay. And we usually left our money there, too. Okay. <laughs> Now, the bowling alley was downstairs from my information that I was gathering here. What direction were the pins and wh you know, which way did they bowl uh, as far as north direct? North and south. North and south. Right. Okay. And the pins are on the south end, am I oh, getting? North end. North end. North end right? All right. Okay. And uh, how many alleys were down there? Four. Four alleys. Four alleys. And was there a bar room down there too? Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, your job was pin setting, so that meant you had to jump out of the way and all that type That's of thing? That's right. Okay. And how many alleys did you handle? So once in a while, two. Okay. Very good. Anybody else that you remember, name-wise, that worked with you? Mm, there were some Casper boys and Leonard boys. Okay. Wow. And what year was this? Do you remember? Oh, it just must have been... From 1935 up to, well, I just did it in the evening, part time. Sure, know, sure. Whatever you needed help. Okay. And how were you paid? Every night. Okay. Uh, uh, how much I don't remember. All right. Probably nickel or ten cents a game. Okay. Uh, because I think bowling was only fifteen cents for a guy that bowled. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we couldn't have got a heck of a lot. Right. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Some occupation, I believe. Well, uh, Fred Jacoby is the, the name. But see, the, the pin setting was incidental for, for like me. Like, uh, if there were a bunch of guys wanting to bowl and there was nobody there, then, then one of us would set pins for our friends, and then Harold gave us, Willard says, five cents a game. Okay. But it wasn't on a regular basis. But I knew one regular pin setter was George Brumeyer, and maybe some of the other boys, too, from the family. And uh, George used to... Uh, regale us the next, uh, the next day all the time with the stories. His favorite night was ladies bowling, and, and it, 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 that the delight came purely from seeing a lot more thigh than you usually saw <laughs> around those days. And George, George Brumeyer told all us guys uh, about 
all the sights he saw. The morning, on the bus, the morning after women's bowling. <laughs> that was a big deal. What year was that? I graduated in 49. He, didn't, he probably here before, 48. So 48. Thanks for us. Very good. Thank you. There was Melvin some. Yeney, uh, Matt Tretner's three boys, they all set pins there yeah. at one time or another. Okay. And I don't know, was uh, am I the only one in the family? No. Well, I, was, I wouldn't be surprised if some of his brothers did too, yeah. but I can't say for sure. And I think my brother did for a short time too. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Richard Wiegand, I have only one question this time. What were the hours and days of operation for Wimler's Tavern? Okay. When did you open? When did you close? And how many days of the year was were we open? When we went home. Thank you. I know. Okay, Vermel. I know. I know. Years ago, there was no really no time limit on on being open, because like I said earlier, when we started bowling, my dad had bowling sometimes nine o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the morning. It wasn't later until the state started saying you have. To you have certain hours, but my mom's hours were always 10 o'clock. We opened up. I can remember that from a kid on. And okay. I know when I was younger, it was what, like with the daylight saving time, it was one o'clock th uh, during the week in, two, in, a, in the winter months and two o'clock in the summertime. But it wasn't like it is now where it's 2.30 on Friday night and Saturday night. See, they, I think they started that when the taverns weren't getting enough sales, ta sending enough sales tax in. Because I can remember when we first started out in business, we sent in about two, three hundred dollars for every three months for sales tax. Well, then he started with the drunk driving laws and stuff, and people were getting, you know, it was getting expensive drinking and driving. So then a lot of people didn't drink anymore. So then they, they missed out on all that, s that sales tax money. So they said, well, now you can go, you can be open at six o'clock in the morning until two, and two thirty on weekends thinking that would generate enough business where they get their sales tax money back, but they keep making the drunk driving laws stiffer and stiffer. People aren't drinking like they used to, which is mm -hmm. fine, but they just don't generate the revenue they did like 20 years ago when we were in business. Mm -hmm. And you can't blame them. Of course, I, I think the younger generation is getting better at it because, well, my son's 23. He doesn't drink much. Sometimes he doesn't drink at all. He's usually a designated driver. And my daughter didn't start drinking until she was 30. So they're pounding it into those kids, which is fine. As long as there's one designated driver, that's good. But when he started out with all this stuff, it, the revenue wasn't there. And then a lot of times, like in the city of Sheboygan, the, the warehouse sales, like Superior Liquor and stuff, they, they close at 9 o'clock. So they said to the city fathers, no place, no place in, that sold alcohol could sell after nine o'clock. So a lot of the bars in Sheboygan can't sell alcohol after nine o'clock. State law has it, you can't sell beer or alcohol after midnight. So I don't know. Okay. A lot of, a lot of times the village or the towns can over see or can ride over the laws of the state. Because like in Milwaukee, there's the city ordinance, they can stay open until three. This was years ago. I don't know if it still is. They overrode the state on the hours. Mm -hmm. I asked my, I, my brother here what hours we were uh, open, and uh, I don't know what he's talking about. The point said he earned a nickel. The pin setter. Oh, the pin setter. Okay. <laughs> earned a nickel a line, and then it went up to a dime a line. Jumping two lanes all night got you six bucks. And I asked him what hours we were open. He says, what hours? So there weren't any hours really until okay, mom did. put her foot down. Did the uh, Wimblers, did they have uh, like Friday night fish fries or certain nights for chicken? Or? No, we didn't have after dad. Well, I don't remember serving meals when I was a kid. I think they stopped. I think the last, I don't want, I know she fed the, uh, the road crew when they built the road. Mm -hmm. But that's a little before my time. Okay. We didn't uh, serve them any food, that much food anywhere. We used to have like a, a soup kitchen where you just plugged it in. Open the can, put it in there, plug it in, and okay. stuff like that. I don't. We didn't really serve sandwiches and stuff All right. towards the end. Thank you. Mary's calling. Hi, I'm Mary Miller. About eating there, when I think it was a CYO, our youth group, 
if we would bowl down there, then Loretta would make like hot tamale for us. Okay. But I mean, otherwise you didn't have anything. And then when the bus picked us up on their corner, Loretta would open up. We could go in the tavern when it was in winter when it was so cold because she was sweeping up anyways. Mm -hmm. okay. So we appreciated your mother very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm Richard Wiegand. Did the uh, Wimblers have bouncers, and did you have a policy about people getting rowdy or drinking too much? Uh, I remember um, my dad used to stop at Teresa Nenning once in a while and took me along in there, and, and Teresa seemed like a kind of a particular lady, and she didn't like just anybody in her bar, but I don't know, you know, if you had a policy about, you know, people or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, we didn't, we had deputies. Um, I don't know if they were, I imagine they were hired, I, they must have been county deputies, but I don't think he used them real often, because I know uh, there's a story, Butch Trazen turned 21, and he came in our tavern, and Roland Fiddler was there, and Roland Fiddler's dad, now I can't remember what Roland Fiddler's dad's name was, but anyways, Butch was very drunk, and I don't know what happened, he was looking for a fight. And Roland Fiddler, dad, says, take him in the dance hall, beat him up. And he went in the dance hall, and Roland Fiddler's arms were so long, and every time Butch Trazen came at him, he'd hold him off and Butch would try and get him, and he couldn't. <laughs> and then when Butch relaxed, Fiddy just slapped him and slapped him. And, you know, I don't know how long, how long it happened or this all happened, all of a sudden, Butch comes out, he's all red in the face, and he's crying, and he goes home. And he was swearing. I can't remember what my mom said. Oh, something about, yeah, you beat up, you know, this and that, whatever, you know. And they thought he was going to go home and come back and, with a gun or whatever, you know. So the next day, he comes in and sits, sits at the bar, and he says to my dad, you know what yesterday was? No. It was my birthday. I was 21. Oh, really, Dad says? You know what happened to me? Dad says, no. I got the shit beat out of me. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> you thank, <know>. thank you. <laughs> oh, God. He's building the street in front of Wimler's, and evidently they must have put the streets in at that time. All of them, maybe, on Cleveland. And would this be the, um, wa the Washington Street? Am I correct? Or the yeah, that would be Washington. Okay. Okay. All right. Is that right? I would think so. Does anybody know when? Does anybody know when they would have paved the streets in Cleveland? I'll pass this around and then maybe there will be somebody else that will have uh, some okay. information. Vernon Crest, the question is when were the, was the street paved in Cleveland? Yes, sir. Uh, I remember the through construction doing it. Oh, okay. It was 1937. 1937. And we got a, it was a big hill towards the west. Okay. And we got uh, Hubert Trossen's old uh, horse and buggy, not the horse, but the buggy. And we tied some uh, ropes on each front uh, axle and we'd push it up and we'd go down. And we'd dodge barrels and everything else. <laughs> you'd ride in this buggy? In this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. What you doing? Uh, Richard Wiegand, I'm reading from the screen here the latest that uh, Charlie Wimler has added here to the discussion. The top bowlers at Wimler's for several years were Reverend Brown or Father Schaefer. Interesting. Did we have bouncers? No, but some dancers at times were under sheriffs. Okay. Um, then uh, we had a time when the Mexicans got out of hand and the word went out that they better police themselves. So when they came to drink, three would sit at a table and drink sodas. When we got rowdy, or when one got rowdy on the soda drink, or one, let's see, when one got rowdy, <laughs> the soda drinker would grab him and set him next to him. When the third soda drinker had, uh, had a drunk, they all went home. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so <laughs> what was there, what's happening is, it's, each one got drunk. They were uh, sort of put under the guidance of the soda drinker. 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then the soda drinker would get drunk. And then they'd all head home, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, and the houses that are up here now, was um, um, Eddie Johnson lives in there now, and um, what's his name? Randy. Frank. Rand, Randy Franks lives here, and my folks' house must have been in here, back okay. in the trees. And what street is that off of the main street? Yes, that's uh, on uh, Ju uh, Juniper. Juniper no. Street. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so again, Wimler's is the tavern or the building yeah, on yeah. the corner. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And Ed, tell him it was Edward and Oscar. Let's see. Here's yeah. Randy. Edward. Uh, Edward. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. Oscar. And then Oscar. Let's see. That was. Okay. Not Edward. Edward on the corner. And Oscar. No. Oh, no, that was a different Lutzi that one time. George. George Lutzi was up here, too. Okay. But, uh, and this is 1936. 1936, okay. Because right. it's stamped right in the road. Oh, it's stamped in the road. Yeah, right. Really? Okay. Uh, right in front of the same area there? Or, uh, well, all the, all the way up and down. If you, if you look down on the road once in a while, okay. you can see that where they get a stamp in there. Where, Oh, okay. 1930. Well, now it would be covered, so you wouldn't see it now. All right. But at that time, it was 1936. Okay, thank you. I'm Marie Pippert. I just happened to think of something. Oh, I was a real young kid, and I used to like uh, to eat crabs. And I remember Henry Matthias and Charlie Wimler, and my dad would get those great big crabs they had that sent in from Maine, a great big wash tub full, and they steamed them at Matthias Dairy. Oh, really? And my mother always said, don't you eat that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> you did eat something. Oh, I ate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Miller. I lived on the block, uh, same block as a fire department, so I just had to cut across Boney's yard, and then I was at my skating pond. Okay. And, oh, a lot of us kids went there, played Crack the Whip. Okay. Cracked my hand. Yeah, <laughs> you cracked your hand, yes, okay. <laughs> and I don't know, it was just nice. It was close to home. Okay. Now that pond, in relation to the Wimler's Hall, where? That was right across the street to the east of it. Okay. All right. What is that street? Juniper. 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 Okay, very good. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. The Anderson, that pond that was across to the east from Wimler's was extra water in case there should be a fire that they would be able to use that water. But I remember one time, and I don't know if there was a flood or something, but we went up there and we used the, and people were um, in some of these big metal uh, things that you feed cows with, and, oh, yeah. and they um, okay. used oars and they were all <laughs> floating around in the pond. In the, in the pond. <laughs> they had fun. <laughs> okay, thank in you. In between the docks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Of the fire of Wimler's, which was March 28th, 1974. Okay, and do, does anybody here know where it started and how at this point, or have any more pictures of it? Is this the same picture? No. Dorothy Anderson, I have this picture. Okay. And do you know where it might have started or heard no. anything? Okay. Does Melvin know? All right, just one moment, thank you. Okay, ah. I have a young lady here who can give us more information about some questions. And that was in regard. Yes. Uh, the, it was asked how the fire started. I really couldn't tell you. All I know is at 8:30 in the morning, I came back from the post office, and uh, I came in. The, my mother always got up at five o'clock to clean the tavern or whatever. Got home, went in the kitchen, and I saw smoke coming out of, of a plug, of a oh. plug in the wall. And I said to my mom, I said, "There's smoke coming out." And she got up. She opened the door to the basement, and there was nothing but smoke down there. Well, I started the siren. I ran across the street and started the siren up. First guy to come was David Down. David Down yells at me, where's the fire? I said, it's my house. <laughs> and I came home. I tried to get the dogs out. We, we were taking care of a cat for somebody. And uh, the cat didn't make it. We got the dogs out. But the, the fire came, came between the, the house and the dance hall. See, when my dad moved the buildings over, they were never flush. There was always a space between them. And he couldn't fight it decent enough because of the metal roof. If the metal roof wouldn't have been on, they probably could have fought the fire, but with the wind and the weather that day, 
the houses in the neighborhood might have gone. So it was one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't. But it, it was between the walls, between, they said it was electrical, I'm sure it was because mm -hmm. it was an, it was an old, old building. Sure. But and it started like, I fell on a fire out at 8.30 in the morning and they, we had like three, four fire departments there, I don't recall anymore. But I know it took my husband 45 minutes to get home from Kohler because of the weather. And they wouldn't let him through when he had to park by the county shop and he had to walk all the way down. But they figured it was electrical. Okay. So. And nobody got injured or anything at this point? No, other than the cat, no. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. My kids, my kids were in school. My child was in school. My husband right. was at work. All right. And we got on all right. Very Anything good. salvageable or no? Not really. We were th my mom thought maybe she could start up the business and stuff, but it was too bad. Yep. You know, we just leveled it. Okay. Thank you. I remember the day of the fire. That was the same day we had a big funeral in Cleveland. Remember that's the day Alma Cain died? Really? Yeah. And uh, she was Gold Star Mother. She lived right across the... Well, she lived in Marie's house mm -hmm. from years back. But anyhow, how long were the fire trucks there? I remember having to move our car... We were right next door to yes. the right. I remember moving our car out of the garage thinking that maybe <laughs> the fire will come that close. Okay. How long were the trucks there and stuff? Do you remember it? On the floor about uh, the fire department being at your facility? Well, the fire, I noticed the fire at 830, and I wouldn't say within five minutes, some of the trucks were there. I couldn't say for certain, but I know it was like in the middle of the afternoon. It had to be, I, I know I went to school at 230 to tell my daughter that the place had burned. All right. And I think the fire trucks were there until after 3 o'clock. Okay. So. All right. But I, I know it was Haven there, and I know Newton was there, and so was Cleveland. Right. Whether there were more there, I, my mother had written a thank you note. All right. And they said there were five fire departments, so it must have been Howard's Grove and, sure. and something else there. Sure. I don't really remember anymore. Okay. Anderson, I just remembered that uh, I stayed in town in Sheboygan uh, during the weekend uh, for high school and came home weekends, and the bus would come and go down as far as Wimler's from Sheboygan to Manitowoc and go down and leave me off there. Okay. Or on Sunday night, my dad would take me up to Wimmer's and oh. the bus came that far and then went on to Sheboygan. So oh, really? So it worked out because he didn't want to get up that early in the morning mm. to take me into school on Monday morning. And that was a Greyhound bus. So this bus actually had a stop, uh, in, at, uh, at, a scheduled in stop Cleveland. in Cleveland yeah, it was at Wilmer's. Mm -hmm. I imagine from Manitowoc to Sheboygan too, but I know that it was yeah. Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah, it would be because it took me Mm -hmm. yeah, it took me Very good. Me. Thank you. Uh, Romello will uh, give us a little bit of information as to uh, a new phase of the Wimler Tavern, and uh, maybe she can give us when the building were built. Okay. Um, my husband checked out looking at homes. And, and your husband, would you give his oh, name, please? This is Romelda. In 1974, we had the fire, and throughout the year after that, my husband, Paul, was thinking of building a house. And then somebody had mentioned, well, for another couple thousand more, you could build a home with a business in it. Okay. And he figured he didn't want his wife working anyway, so she, he brought the business into the home, mm -hmm. and I ran the tavern. Okay. We started building. We went. We checked. My mother had checked in rebuilding, but at her age, it would never mm -hmm. have worked out. Mm -hmm. And they said, don't put a basement underneath. It's cheaper going with a slab. Okay. And we went to Men's Builders in West Bend, and we had a, our guy, and our, the, the bar was designed by somebody in Shoto. Okay, yes. He, some of these big people aren't even in business anymore. And he decided, well, we started like in March or April of 1975, and it was done by, in June already, because it was, it was a steel building. Mm -hmm. They just put the sheets up. And I still can remember, I had to get my license. I was so busy on the 30th of June because we were going to open up the 1st, legally, we could open up the 1st of July. We couldn't get any liquor, to, no liquor or beer, because we didn't have a license yet. Our license started July 1st in 1975. Oh, oh, oh. Well, my husband's aunt and uncle, Johnny Sessler and Val, oh, own a tavern, so sure. they gave us a half a case of brandy and a half a case of whiskey as a Is grand opening gift. For we sake. had soda, and we had an ice machine. And Mr. Lewis was nice enough to drop off a half barrel, illegally, of course. And I forgot to get changed. Francis Schmidt went home and got his...
coffee can full of change. <laughs> well, I figure we were safe. Well, not real safe, because most of the village board was in it at that night. They all stopped in the village board, whoever was on at that time. Yeah. When it was midnight, I went, we're legal now. <laughs> and I had, I mean, I forgot, completely forgot to go to the bank, and I'm going, oh, nuts. So here, we're taking in this money and stuff, and I says, I'm out of singles. Anybody got any? I got five. Here's five. Here, you know. <laughs> One bag of I was getting changed from all the customers, you know. So the next day, July 1st, that's when we got a first delivery for alcohol. But it was it was really strange how the people in the village of Cleveland came on. I mean, I'm trying to get everything organized at 2 o'clock in the afternoon while you're going in and out. The door's open. Next thing, I got people sitting at my bar, and I'm going, I can't do this. You know, I got things to do, but I had it. You know, my husband didn't get home to work from till three thirty, from Kohler. And when he did get did get home, I thought I completely forgot about going to the bank. The bank closed what at four o'clock, and I had a half an hour span to get. I didn't. My mom gave us, I think she gave us like thirty five hundred dollars to start out with, with the little incidentals like change and whatever we needed. You know, but it was it was unreal. I mean, we, we were so busy that first night. And I'm going, oh, boy, I wish you would have put scent earlier in. It was hot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then we've been running it ever since. Now okay. that my husband has retired, okay. we have put it up for sale. It's, but my brother's trying to talk me into stand, sticking around another uh, three or four years. And then what? Well, then we can have another party. <laughs> yeah, a woman has been on that spot for 100 years. Oh, really? Oh. 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 Yeah. And your name of your prayer... Uh, well, Prenders. it was called Wimler's Bar, now it's Pauly's Palace, Pauly's which Palace. I'm not too keen about because I'm not a Pauly. I'm an Albright. <laughs> but that's the way Pauly started out. So, well, what should we call this place? And then somebody, before we had to sign out in front, somebody said, well, why don't you call it Pauly's Palace? And it's it stuck. And it stuck. Stuck for 27 years. 27 20, years. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, very, very good. I don't know if I want to make it to the 2008 to celebrate the 100th one. It's bad enough celebrating the 25th anniversary of being in business. <laughs> well, thank you very okay. much. Appreciate it. I just happened to think they wanted to know who the attorney was when I worked for Dr. Reinhardt. Yes. And his name was Vogt, V-O-I-G-T. I can't remember his first name. Okay. Now I just have to think of it. V-O-I-G-T. Okay. Thank you. Richard here, and uh, we've uh, discussed yeah. many things about Wimler's. And uh, I guess Richard would like to convey some thoughts and thank you here. Yeah, Richard Wiegand, um, uh, we're finishing off the evening here, and I'd like to thank Charlie Wimler for, for plugging into the technology here by email and, and uh, talking to us from uh, North Carolina. We really appreciate the information, and I'd like to thank everybody who came tonight. Uh, we, again, have a very good turnout and a very good crowd and a lot of information and well-focused um, on the subject at hand, so uh, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Sixel, and did em everybody know who this was in the picture in the Jeep? No. Could you show that to me again? Uh, and could you tip it As there? That's great. Oh, that's very good. Okay, we, this was a card that uh, Kathy had sent out as a reminder to have, that we're having a meeting this evening, and uh, there's a question pertaining to the gentleman in the Jeep. And anybody have that answer? Vernon, could you please tell us about this photo? Yeah, good idea. Well, we're coming on to a gentleman here, and he has a smile on his face. <laughs> uh, I'm Vernon Chris. Yes, sir. About this photo? Yes, sir. Uh, that was taken about two days after Pearl Harbor. I was up in Seattle, Washington. We were ready to get on ship and take off. Okay. And uh, when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, that canceled everything. T uh, three days later, our trucks came back, and we drove them from Seattle all the way to McCord Field. I remember making three trips in one day. Okay, McCord Field is located where? Between Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. Okay. The big air base. Okay. And uh, I stayed there for about a month. Yes, sir. And I got shipped clear across the country, one week on a train, to New Jersey. Okay. I was there maybe three weeks, and I went to Florida. Okay. And, uh, oh, about 
two, three months later, I got shipped over to Texas. My goodness. So I had uh, three corners, and I started out in Fort Riley, Kansas. So I was in the center of the United States and three corners. <laughs> and if I may ask, what rank were you at at this time, or what was your job? Corporal. Uh, uh, I drove a refueling truck, semi, okay. refueling airplanes. All right. And uh, from Texas, I went to Louisiana, and uh, they were going to harden us up to go to India, you know, for heat. Okay. So we could take the heat down there. Yeah. And where did they send us? Iceland. <laughs> I was way the heck up. Well, it wasn't too bad, but you know, we yeah. could take it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in Iceland, you what was the situation there? Was it a base there then? Oh yeah, big base. Okay. Big army air base. Okay. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, there was like a stopping base. From England, they'd stop over there, we'd refuel, and then they go to the United States. Okay. And vice versa. All right. So. Okay. And you were in charge of a fuel truck for the uh, aircraft? I drove a semi, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, that uh, was It wasn't too big, though. Not like the trucks they have today. Yeah, yeah. That was a standard Jeep, right? No, no, that, that Jeep, oh, that, that, that oh. was a joke. That was a joke? No, I, I, this is a, a truck. It was a six-wheel drive truck, GMC okay. truck. Okay. All with right. a 94 5-horsepower six-cylinder engine under the hood. Ah. That's why my right arm is so <laughs> <I'm> shifting. <laughs> I had to go 40 miles one way from where the big uh, barrel bunkers were. Yes. Take it up to Keflavik. Okay. To refuel the airplanes. So. All right. But uh, I can see something in that picture. You were a pretty handsome gentleman, and I can see why well, I still this am. young yeah. <laughs> I think this young lady was pretty attractive to you. <laughs> I think it was just turned around. Oh really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I do thank you, Vernon. Thank you a lot. Uh, yes, sir. In about three, four months, yes. we'll have 60 years together. Really? Well, wonderful. Uh, congratulations ahead of time. Thank you. Very good. First, we got to make it, though. Yeah, you, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Thank you again, sir. I have something very interesting here, and Walter and Florence Crest brought this, and it is from the Hall of Flame. And I think we spoke about this last time, or one of the other times. Yeah, right. Right. Okay, thank you. And there's other photos, and Walter also has a cap, which I hope he will model for us. <laughs> okay. Now, they had visited down there? Uh, would you like to, uh, why don't you let get them? The, yeah, okay. let them get Just to one it, second, all right? please. I want to finish out the... Oh, the, I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, I've got a gentleman wearing a unique hat here. And maybe he can indicate where he got it and what the occasion was. Go right ahead and identify yourself, please. I'm Walter Kress, and you talked about this Hall of Flame. Yes, sir. Our son and his wife were in Phoenix, Arizona, and went to this Hall of Flame. Okay. Our granddaughter teaches in Phoenix, and they wanted to see her. All right. Here's postcards of the fire trucks that were a Badger Fire Department in Haika. Ah, okay. And they're in this Hall of Flame now. It is there? Yes. Wonderful. My goodness. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add to that for us? They were looking for the bell, but they couldn't come up with the bell that was on the tower. Okay. All right. But uh, that is, a, is that a national uh, uh, museum. museum? Museum. Okay. Wonderful. That's very unique. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Rich Hankey from Manitowoc, and I'm modeling all the buildings on either side of the tracks in Cleveland. Okay. And I'm trying to do that as close to, uh, close to 1950 on either side of that a couple of years as possible. I see. And I talked to Vernon Cress about the Cheese House. All and, right. And uh, I brought it along tonight just to show him to make sure that the things I'm putting on it are proper. Okay. Okay. He, he described it very carefully. Okay. And uh, that's why I was able to do that. All right. So uh, I've got some little parts here I wanted them to look at. Okay. Could I just have you rotate that slowly around, please? And what side are no, that being? this is HO scale. And this is HO scale. Could you give us what that ratio is, please? It would be about, uh, you know, like a toy, you know, like the kids' toy trains. It would be, the cars would be about like this. It would be about eighth inch scale. Okay. Eighth All right. Scale, that's roughly. close enough. Not exactly, but pretty close to it. Okay. So I wanted Vernon to look at that. To make sure I had all the, you know, like this would be the thing that uh, 
they would cover the cheese with wax. Okay. And there was evidently some sort of a, a thing that would lower the cheese, you know, the chunks of cheese into this uh, hot wax. Oh, yes. Okay. And they would lift it out and put it on some other cart. And, right. and they would put it on this uh, platform here, and then the <clears throat> the, excuse me, the uh, refrigerator cars would come and pick them up. Okay. How, yeah. how large would that be, uh, full size, that piece? This building here, this is the, still in Cleveland. It's I mean, still this in building. Cleveland. What, what, what building? It was the co-op's uh, service building for years, that brick one. Right. Oh, okay. Now, this part here, the cooling tower is gone. Okay. So that's probably why it, maybe you don't recognize, or people may not recognize it. All but right. I got a picture from that they had a, in the co-op, there was a large picture, an aerial view of the uh, the whole co-op. Yes, sir. And it was 1950, I believe, or 48. Okay. And this is how it looked in 1948. Okay. So that's when I wanted to model it. So all those buildings in that area, I'm looking to uh, commemorate. All right. So then I'll have, <clears throat> this will be in my basement, and there'll be cars that come up. Ah, okay. Much the same way they did sure. then. The sure. Vernon Cress, you know, he... Uh, just a wonderful memory. I, and I he know that. He <laughs> described it very carefully how they would bring cars in and they would move them around. And, okay. And depending on the price of cheese, is how many uh, cars they would get to. All right. You know, take out the cheese. Okay. On which side of the building would be the tracks? Then the track would be on the east side of the building. All right. Now this is facing the lake. Okay. Could you rotate that building one more time, just slowly around, so we See can see now. Currently, there's a door over on this side. All right. <clears throat> Vernon told me that there wasn't at the time. There'd be a little chimney. These are just cardboard. Sure. Oh, but excellent. I'll, I, I'm not obviously I'm not done with it, but I wanted wow. to ask him what it was like inside. Sure. So. Well, very good. We appreciate that too. Oh, sure. And your name again, please. Rich Hankey. Thank you very much, Rich. Friend of Fred. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> and everybody else for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I want to thank everyone for coming, and I hope you benefited from uh, Ramelda's nice presentation. Our next meeting will be July 14th, and I hope we'll be back at the town hall. Brian Kramer booked another meeting. Well, tonight, for tonight, uh, tonight, huh? Tonight, Or the yeah. review. Pardon? Or the review was tonight, yeah. So okay. there was nothing, you know, we could do about that, and that's why we came here, and then... Uh, Ramelda talked about doing the chat with her brother Charlie, and that's why we had to come down to this room. Okay, and that's about it. Okay, we'll very good. see you all next month. Okay, I want to thank everybody also. Very informative evening, and we have hope to see you back here on July 14th. Thank you. Not the town hall. Not the town hall, I'm sorry, not this building. And are we going to meet earlier again? 6.30. 6.30? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not done yet.